Quilts for so many people are simply covers that they throw over their beds and wrap themselves up in when the weather turns cold. Maybe the advent of central heating is one of the reasons why the craft of quilting has been somewhat forgotten over the years and few people have experienced the pleasure of making and keeping handcrafted quilts. However, there has been a huge craft resurgence of late, which has included several other forms of needlework, such as embroidery and patchwork. During this surge in popularity, many people have started to experience the joy of quilting, which is so satisfying and can even prove to be rather pleasantly addictive. Modern day society is awash with mass produced fittings and dressings for the home that make one house look identical to the next. But with crafts such as quilting, you can now surround yourself with beautiful original conversation pieces that will always get your visitors talking. One of the many misconceptions about quilting is that it's a laborious task to make and complete a whole quilt. It's true that a king-sized bed throw might well take a while to sew, but the enjoyment and relaxation that people get out of the process is worth the effort alone. You can even quilt while you're watching television or listening to music. And if you use a design that calls for individual blocks, you can take one with you to stitch wherever you go. Consequently, if you use your time wisely, your quilt will begin to take shape and grow in no time at all. And of course, you can always start with something smaller, like a cushion. The origins of quilting, however, were not quite as relaxed or tranquil as the craft we practice today. Just like other forms of sewing, quilting grew out of a need to produce warm clothing and blankets that could keep a family warm through bitterly cold winters. Like many other crafts, because quilts were created in the home, the exact date of when it all began has been lost somewhere over time. It's known that quilted fabric was around in ancient Egypt, but it wasn't until several thousand years later, during the 18th century, that the form of quilting, which we know and love today, began to take shape. Up until this point in time, fabric was not factory produced, so women had to spend much of their time weaving and knitting in their own homes to produce blankets and garments for their family. The process of hand weaving was lengthy, so there was no time to play around with the material, as necessity was far more important than creativity. 
Nevertheless, as the Industrial Revolution gathered pace, the noise of a thousand fabric looms started to roar, and by the early 19th century, it was estimated that well over 10,000 power looms were in operation in Great Britain. A vast quantity of material was being produced, which made the price drop to make it affordable for ordinary people to buy, and the mills, particularly in the north of England, turned out wool and cotton fabrics to meet the demand. For many people, the arduous task of weaving was no longer required, and the homemakers of the time were starting to become more creative with their quilt production methods, including patchwork, and the art of quilting became even more popular. This is Chawton Cottage in the heart of the Hampshire countryside and its most famous occupant was better known for her writing than her sewing. This was the home of Jane Austen, the author responsible for such great English classics as Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility and Emma. And as we all know, her young ladies were expected to be highly accomplished in every aspect of needlework. For visitors to Jane Austen House, now a wonderful museum, there's a real treat in store if they happen to be quilters. In the great lady's modest bedroom, a beautiful hand-stitched quilt hangs upon the wall, made by Jane and her sister Cassandra. We know from their letters that the pair were always on the lookout for patches for their quilt and like so many quilts, it really is a very precious piece of living history. Quilting developed as a much-practiced needlecraft all over Britain, but it was also very popular across the Atlantic in America. And today, when you mention quilting, most people will think of the USA. Over the years, the Americans became very skilled in both patchwork and quilting. The women of colonial America embraced both crafts and to this day you will find quilting bees taking place all over the USA, which is where a number of stitchers join together to work on one quilt or their own individual projects in the company of others. Interestingly, as there has been a resurgence of interest in both crafts, this practice has become ever more popular in Britain as well. This has been instrumental in people using more modern techniques to bring quilting right up to date, although there are plenty of quilters keeping the traditional designs alive. Now, if the sight of these beautiful quilts fills you with trepidation, fear not, it's not as complicated as it looks. Even though a quilt is one complete item, it's actually made out of three separate elements and this is why they are actually so warm. Today, mountaineers will use light layers to build up for warmth, and this is precisely how a quilt works. Looking at a finished quilt, you'll see two sections, the top and the bottom, and be able to feel the third, the padding. The top is generally the most decorative part of the quilt, as it's the section that everyone will see and is usually covered with all sorts of stitching patterns and can either be one complete piece of material or made up of lots of smaller pieces of patchwork.
But before we go any further, it will be very helpful to take a quick overview of the craft of patchwork. Of course, it isn't necessary to do patchwork to get into quilting, as you can see demonstrated here. However, patchwork and quilting really do go hand in hand. Many quilting pattern books will mention both crafts, but remember that the only limitation once you've acquired the basic skills will be your imagination. So don't feel hemmed in, pardon the pun, by any of the traditional styles. Quilters will often start off making patchwork so that they can then turn it into a quilt. As you can see from these examples, the patchwork is made from shapes that tessellate to produce a complete design. It's always best to design your pattern on some squared paper first so that you can be sure your finished creation will fit together and of course you can also pick colours that will work well together. Good patchwork is just as much about colour coordination as it is about perfectly fitting shapes. After you've planned your design, it's just a case of cutting out your fabric shapes and sewing them precisely together to make the finished article. These hexagon pieces of patchwork have been made on accurately cut papers which have then been overstitched together and a lot of people start patchwork with hexagons as they fit together perfectly and you can make as many seven hexagon flowers as you like but just one at a time which will make even a large piece of patchwork very easy to handle. This pattern is called Log Cabin and is made from a series of measured rectangles and you can then progress onto more complicated styles like Cathedral Window. But you don't have to do any of these traditional patterns. This is called Crazy Patchwork and is self-explanatory, created at random for a cushion cover that is now ready to be quilted. There is a programme in this series called An Introduction to Patchwork, which will give you a lot more information about getting started. And once you've got the hang of it, you'll be designing pieces for quilting in no time at all. Patchwork is far from being the only option because there are some wonderful fabrics available with designs that are suitable for quilting. Also, many stitchers like to use applique as well, which basically means cutting out a complete design and stitching it onto a backing fabric. This quilt uses a lot of applique and you can see that it's a very quick way to cover large areas with 
very attractive designs. This will give you lots of food for thought when it comes to selecting the top layer of your piece of quilting. And don't forget, you can always use a plain fabric if you want the quilting to be the main feature. While you're selecting the fabric for the top of the quilt, it's best to choose the backing at the same time. Even though some people do like to put a patchwork back to their quilts, it's generally accepted that one large piece of complementing fabric is perfect. After all, if you've gone to all the trouble of making two large pieces of patchwork, the least you want is two quilts that show off your efforts at all times. Also, do remember that you might want to have this layer next to your skin and therefore it's better to have something soft and smooth rather than patchwork, which can be a bit scratchy in texture. The process of quilting, very simply put, is the craft of sewing these two layers together with a further layer of padding in between them. And again, it's a good idea to buy this at the same time as you're sorting out your fabrics. Different people use a variety of words to describe this layer of the quilt usually batting, padding or wadding. There are a range of weights of wadding that you can buy from your local craft shop and the prices will reflect the quality. For the best quality there's a 100% cotton wadding, however as you would expect this is also the most expensive. More and more people are turning to synthetic wadding and the man-made fibres can be just as good, especially when you're starting out. In fact, synthetic fibres are much harder wearing compared to cotton and are also less prone to shrinking in the wash. The decision is of course entirely up to you and to help you make your mind up, have a browse around your local craft shop and feel the different weights on offer. Mixed fibres are proving very popular today too, consisting of a mixture of man-made and natural fibres, offering the enthusiastic quilter the best of both worlds. Fibre mixtures are also in the middle price range, which would be helpful if you want to make a larger sized quilt. With the three different segments of the quilt now covered, it's time to take a look at the rest of the materials and equipment you're going to need to get started. Ironically, the requirements are minimal, which can come as a surprise when you see the intricacy of the finished work. Although it's possible to have a go at quilting with just about any good sewing needle, you will do a much better job with specialist quilting needles, or betweens as they're sometimes called. 
Quilting needles are very sharp as they need to penetrate three layers of material and will usually be slightly thicker than average. Try to buy a good selection because you'll need different sizes depending on the thickness of your thread and material. Along with your quilting needle, you'll most probably find a number of glass-tipped pins very handy to temporarily secure your layers together. The only reason that we suggest glass-tipped pins is because they're easier to spot in the material due to their bright tips. If you can only find ordinary pins, then these are absolutely fine to use, but do remember to carefully search all over your finished quilt for any pins, as you really don't want to be pricking yourself with one as you wrap yourself up on a chilly evening. The thread that you decide to use will vary depending on what kind of quilt you're making. Some quilts will look all the better for having brightly coloured thick threads that contrast with the backing material and other quilts look far better when the thread blends into the background. You'll probably want to buy a selection of quilting threads to keep in your craft box to get you started and then you can add more as and when they're needed. Way back in history, patchwork and quilting were excellent techniques for reusing part-worn fabric and naturally these pieces of material had been washed many times. Now some stitchers today, using new materials, prefer to wash everything before they begin. This is where planning well can really help you because if you're making patchwork for a quilting project, try to make sure that you use fabric that will react similarly to washing. Also, if you use all different types of fabric, then the finished patchwork will not lay flat and can also look very haphazard. The same rule goes for your backing and again it's advisable to use the same type of material on the back as you do on the front to avoid anything shrinking. When washing your fabric be aware of the colours you're using too as your front and back will of course be washed as one garment so choose colours that can be washed together on a regular basis. It's no good having a red front and white back as the red will be likely to run after a few washes and you could end up with a pink quilt. Another good tip to mention here is not to use any fabric softener when laundering at this stage because if you do the material will go very limp and it'll make it much harder to work on. There are folk who even go in completely the opposite direction and use starch to help stiffen their material. This isn't essential, but well worth thinking about if you prefer to stitch on stiffer material. You'll now have all the essentials you need to start your quilting project. But if you've never done any craft work before, do get yourself some good scissors to help you get the best results. One pair for fabric, one pair for paper, and a small pair of embroidery scissors for fine finishing. Make sure you've also got something to keep your ongoing project in, where it won't get dirty, as these quilts can take a long time to complete. A selection of papers, especially squared, to create patterns on will also be useful and an embroidery pencil that you can draw designs directly onto the fabric with can be an added bonus. But that really is all you're going to need, so all that's left to do now is thread up your needle and begin quilting. There are three methods generally used when making quilts, basically hand quilting, 
machine quilting and tying. Each method is pretty self-explanatory and they can all be very useful depending upon what type of project you are undertaking. All the techniques vary from one another but they all have one process in common in that they all need to have the three layers of fabric basted or tacked together. If you're an experienced stitcher, then you will already know how important this preparatory stage is. But don't worry if not, it really is very simple and will save you hours of frustration in the long run. All we're talking about is quickly sewing the layers of material together to hold them precisely in place, basically so your quilting will end up exactly where you want it. Don't fret about how messy your basting looks as once you've finished your quilting block all the stitches will be removed anyway. Most people use a large running stitch in a contrasting colour to base their fabric because it's very quick yet secure and easy to remove when you've finished. Firstly, cut your fabric to your desired size and then cut the wadding so that it's fractionally smaller. The next stage needs to be carried out with real precision and is a good habit to get into even if you're only making a practice square. The last thing you want will be ruffles and folds all over your quilt block before you've even started. To ensure that it all lays flat, it's a good idea to tape your backing fabric to a smooth surface with a little masking tape. If you're making a large quilt, then this method can still be utilised by taping the back into the carpet or a very large table. Once the backing is secured smoothly to your surface, you can then lay the wadding and the front on top of it. Next, use a few pins and secure the pieces in place. There's actually a particular way to baste and even though it sounds time consuming, it's really very quick once you pick it up. For beginners, basting is an extremely underrated aspect of quilting. Many people who are starting to learn rush this section and head straight for the more creative work. However, this causes no end of problems with slipped material, awkward folds and puckering. If you learn how to baste correctly before you start quilting, when it does come to the actual stitching, you'll find it far easier and enjoyable to do. Have a quick look here at this example that shows you the grid formation that's created with the running stitches. All you really have to remember is to always start in the middle of the fabric and work your way out. So you would first of all make across the whole length and breadth of the block. Then, all the other running stitches will always start from the four lines of the cross and either work to one side or the other. You never make a whole line of stitches from the top all the way to the bottom. If you always begin in the middle, it will further ensure the accuracy of your piece and more importantly, smooth out any folds. Our next step is to complete all the vertical basting lines, working one side of the cross and then the other, making sure you keep smoothing the material from the middle out as you go to remove all the ruffles. Once all the vertical lines are completed, we can then stitch all the horizontals in the same way to complete the basting. The finished piece will have a series of stitched squares all over it, about 2 inches or 5 centimetres in size. Don't worry if the squares aren't all perfect shapes, because it's more important to make sure that it all lies absolutely flat, ready for the next stage. 
hand stitching is still the preferred method used by many quilters today and although it may not be as quick as using a sewing machine, the accuracy that it offers is still second to none. Stitching by hand can also be very calming and if you're taking up quilting as a stress relieving hobby then this style of sewing is particularly hard to beat. The stitch used for quilting is extremely easy and can be picked up in a matter of moments even if you're a complete novice in needlecraft. All you need to master is an even running stitch which penetrates all three layers of material to successfully learn how to quilt. Simply pass the needle in and out of the fabric layers like we're doing here so that a broken line is produced in the direction the pattern is heading. Try to produce your running stitch so that all the stitches are of the same size and the gaps between each stitch are also the same. Always remember these few points and you can't go wrong and in no time at all you'll be quilting confidently. What machine quilting loses in charm, it more than makes up for in time and energy conservation. As you can see, a machined quilt like this one uses a vast number of stitches and the evenness and consistent tension make it lie beautifully flat. There's nothing inferior about machine quilting. It's a perfectly acceptable method to make a quilt. It's also worth considering having the best of both worlds by doing the more intricate work by hand and then switching when it comes to some of the larger areas to the sewing machine. The third method is less well known but can create a quilt in its own right. Tying is very popular amongst quilters who want to make a thick fluffy cover often called a comforter. Because the quilt is not covered in stitches, it allows the natural thickness of the wadding to remain rather than being compacted by the stitches in more traditional quilting. Baste your quilt sandwich just as we did earlier. Then take your threaded needle, make a stitch in through the front of the quilt where you want your first tie to be and then bring the needle back through to the top a little way in front of it. We don't want to cut the thread yet it's usually much quicker just to insert the needle in a new spot in the position you want the next knot to be placed. Then simply make another stitch, bring the needle up and through and then insert the needle again in the third position for the next stitch. When you're making a large quilt, the usual distance is between 3 and 6 inches apart, which is anything up to about 15 centimetres. Just remember that the further apart the knots are, the quicker it will be to complete the quilt. However, it will also make the quilt weaker when you come to wash it. What we have now may look a little messy, however in a few moments you'll see the quilting take shape very quickly. Cut the strands between each stitch so that there's a length hanging loose. Try to make sure there's at least two inches trailing from each end as it will make it far less fiddly to tie. The particular knot that we need to use to keep everything firmly in place is called the square knot. Don't worry, it's one of the simplest knots to learn. All you have to do is make a normal knot as if you were tying up a shoelace and then before tightening it off, make another knot and firmly secure the whole thing. 
Then trim the ends till they are as long or short as you want them to be. You can use embroidery silks, coloured wool, string or anything at all you can thread through a needle. So this is a wonderful technique if more abstract quilting is more to your taste. Now we've learnt these three methods of quilting, you can go off and make cushions, quilts and wall hangings in all manner of different shapes, sizes and designs. However, you will notice as you look closely at some of these beautifully handcrafted examples that they have a number of fancy stitching patterns on them and this is where quilting turns from a skillful craft into an intricate art. Nevertheless, no matter how intricate, they all still use our simple running quilting stitch, so it's only a case of practice making perfect. This pattern is known as quilting in the ditch and is so simple it's often the first pattern that people learn when making a patchwork quilt. All you have to do is use your quilting stitch which penetrates all the three layers and follow the lines on your patchwork top. Quilting in the ditch is best shown with something straightforward like the hexagons we have here. Many people use quilting in the ditch because it's very simple due to the fact that you're following the lines that are already there, so you can't really go wrong and it's almost invisible when complete, blending in with the join between the fabrics. Quilting patchwork will certainly help to keep your stitches straight, but once you've got the idea, you can use the same principles on plain top fabrics. These patchwork squares are very easy to follow, but when you think about it, all you are doing is quilting a slightly more accurate grid than the one you basted in to hold your quilting together in the first place and you can certainly do this on a plain top fabric. If it's easier, use a ruler to draw out your squares on the back of the block and then you can be sure of being accurate. If you'd prefer something a little more abstract, take your pencil and create a totally imaginative pattern on the back of your block. Wavy lines are fabulous, particularly if you use a silky top layer and about the only advice to offer compositionally would be to never let the lines cross for a really free finish. When you've practiced this a few times, you might find you'd rather work on the top of the block without the guidelines and simply follow wherever your needle takes you. There will be occasions when you don't want to hide your quilting stitches and our next quilting type is a wonderful example of one such time. Outline quilting will follow all the seams on the top layer and if you've used applique as a technique, it will really highlight your work. You'll soon discover the quilting patterns that suit you best and many will allow you far more creativity as you progress and you can really do as you please when you've got the hang of it. 
we'll now take a look at some examples of quilting and explain how they have been done. This is an example of cording or Italian quilting as it's sometimes known. Although this is slightly more advanced, you'll pick it up very quickly indeed. As before, prepare a quilt sandwich, but this time we don't use any wadding because it would detract from the raised cord design. Italian quilting is purely decorative and not designed for warmth. Pick a straightforward design, as anything too complex would look rather messy. Have a look at this sample we have here. The design still has detail in it, but it's spaced out to create a neat and tidy pattern. Once you've chosen your pattern, transfer the design to the back of the piece you're quilting. You can use an embroidery pencil for this, so it will wash off easily. All you need to do then is use running stitch all the way along the design, ensuring that the two parallel lines of stitching remain at about a quarter of an inch apart, roughly six millimetres in metric. Once you've stitched all the lines around the design, the fun really begins as you need to thread the cord through the parallel set of lines. Wool is probably the best yarn to use for the purpose of Italian quilting. However, you can get special wadding, as you see here, from your craft supplier. Just make sure you buy a thickness that will fit through the gap. Use a tapestry needle between sizes 18 and 14, which should fit nicely and also give you a big enough eye to thread the wool into. Now insert the needle into the gap and start to thread the cord through. All you have to remember is that once the needle can't be pushed in any further, poke it out of the fabric pull it through and then reinsert it back into the same hole and carry on. Always do this on the wrong side of the fabric, so if you do make a mistake and can't get the needle to go back down the same hole, it will not be too noticeable. When complete, you can of course make a cushion out of a piece like this or a whole quilt if you wanted something that was totally decorative. While we're on the subject of cushions, this style would be a very good point at which to begin if you're looking for a project that won't take years to complete. Classically elegant, this square cushion has a beautiful quilting pattern that was first designed on paper before being stitched with great precision. The fabric chosen is intrinsic to the design and would certainly fit into any modern interior, no matter how minimalist. Patchwork does work very well with certain decorative styles, especially the ever popular shabby chic, but generally it can tend to be consigned to the bedroom. This cushion just shows how, if you give your imagination free reign, the results of quilting are anything but old-fashioned. Also, there's no need to keep this wonderfully diverse craft just for quilts. You can mix and match it with plenty of other styles, adding just a touch of quilting as an accent. The edge of this delightful cushion sets off the piece a treat and if you're looking for a project that isn't too ambitious to get you started, a small amount of quilting will give you a great sense of satisfaction. Remember, there's no need to think big if you don't want to and you can of course be even less traditional if you so choose. 
This quilting block is ready for completion so that it can be framed as a picture. The use of applique will be a delight to quilt and with the rosebud embellishments already in place, this certainly will end up with a very contemporary feel. Incidentally, the rosebuds have been made by cutting circles of fabric which are then hemmed. A piece of wadding has been placed in the centre and the circumference has been gathered to complete the effect. Nevertheless, if you do get bitten by the quilting bug, and it does happen before you even know it, sooner or later you will want to tackle a full-sized quilt. Here are four examples that we've been looking at through the course of this programme in close-up detail. Firstly, this machined quilt has been created with a mixture of traditional patchwork blocks and applique. With teddy bears, ducks and even elephants, it would be wonderful for a child's room. Also, take note of how carefully the colours have been matched using pastel shades. Although most quilts give the impression of being random, the best ones are anything but. So make sure you scrutinise carefully any that you get to see to pick up as many tips and ideas as you can. Our next quilt has also been machine made, but the shapes on this one are far more geometric. Look closely and you can see just how immaculate this machine stitching is. It would be impossible to hand stitch so accurately and of course the strength of the sewing would make this work of art far more hard wearing for everyday use. Equally, notice how much stronger the colours selected are on this occasion. However, the tones still complement each other perfectly and this wouldn't look out of place in a more contemporary bedroom. Moving on to a hand stitch quilt, there's no denying the fact that this masterpiece before you now took a number of years to complete. But the lady who created it says she enjoyed every single stitch and has put it aside to hand down to a grandchild who used to sit and watch her sewing for hours on end. The time involved is in part due to the amount of work that went into the patchwork chop layer. Earlier we saw what's known as English patchwork with the hexagons made on paper templates. By contrast, this patchwork was made using the American style, which doesn't use paper templates at all. Here are all the leftover patches and as you can see there was an awful lot of cutting out before the sewing even got started. To stitch the patches together they are put right sides face to face and a seam is stitched on the wrong sides. This gives a flawless finish when pressed out on the right side and makes quilting very easy indeed. This quilt also demonstrates how very effective it can be to leave the edge of the design plain for some freehand quilting and if you look closely you'll see patterns that echo the style of the entire piece. In fact, if you look at the back you can see the stitches even more clearly and they are just as neat as they are on the front. If this all seems just too daunting for words, remember that it was basted with a grid as demonstrated earlier on a much smaller scale and the patterns were simply drawn on the wrong side with an embroidery pencil and followed stitch by stitch. And naturally, because this quilt is all made of cotton, there was no problem at all washing it and of course the guidelines magically disappeared. It's also worth pointing out with this quilt what you need to do to tidy up and finish off your edges. 
take a narrow strip of fabric and hem it over the edge as you would with bias binding. In fact, the edging is the only thing that has been done by machine on this quilt, which after all that fancy hand sewing must have been quite a relief. Sadly, our time looking at quilts is rapidly drawing to a close, but we've still got a few moments left to look in more detail at this remarkable quilting project, which is absolutely unique. The lady who made this quilt didn't want to use patchwork and opted for a plain top layer. A great deal of time and effort nevertheless still went into the design and like every quilt you will ever see has a story all its own to tell. Whether you paint, draw, write or sew, the best works of art always come from a moment of inspiration and the magnificent cathedral dominating the West Country city of Gloucester triggered this quilt. All the stitching designs were taken from the cathedral and using photographs she had taken, our quilter made her patterns completely from scratch and you can see some of them here. The centre of the quilt is based on the design on an ancient font and the edges reflect the shapes of the cathedral's beautiful windows. Don't be concerned if your drawing skills aren't highly developed. It's the basic shapes that you need to look out for. Squared paper can be an absolute lifesaver as you can be really precise. And of course, if you're tackling something like an archway, it will be symmetrical. Rather than trying to match the two sides, all you have to do is draw the one side and cut it out on folded paper using the crease as the centre and when you open it up you'll have a perfectly symmetrical shape. The overall effect is as lovely as the magnificent building that inspired it. However, although technically completed, the quilter in question feels she could add more rows of stitches to enhance the design further. So who knows, this might still be a work in progress. And on that intriguing note, an introduction to quilting really has come to an end. Hopefully you'll be inspired to try this most traditional and practical of crafts for yourself. There is nothing that you've seen in this programme that couldn't be tackled with a little know-how and plenty of practice. So the question has to be, what are you waiting for? You can use quilting in so many forms and we really have only scratched the surface of this immense topic. Once you've grasped the basics, you can use quilting to really enhance your soft furnishings and of course, if you're fashion conscious, you can make bags and jackets that will not only look fantastic, but also be extremely practical as well. But most importantly of all, remember to start small, gain experience and then get adventurous. And if it's at all possible, don't go it alone. Find out if there's a quilting group in your area and join with other like-minded stitchers to really get the most out of this extremely popular craft and experience a pastime that will quickly become an intrinsic and precious part of your life. Thank you.